Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a new edition of the Daily Debate. In tonight's show we're going to be focusing on the presence review of the present and future projects at the Suez Canal Economic Zone, really stressing on the importance of uh, focusing the investments on localizing the technological aspects of the industries and investments there. We're going to be focusing on this topic tonight, but before we start doing that, let's check out some of the stories making the news today. And we'll start off with Dar el Ifte announcing that the holy month of Ramadan would end on Wednesday and that Eid al Fitr, or the Lesser Barim, will begin on Thursday. Marking the occasion, President Abdel Fattah al Sisi exchanged messages of congratulations with their majesties and excellencies, kings and heads of Arab and Islamic countries. In his message, President al Sisi expressed his sincere congratulations to the leaders and their people. On this occasion, calling on Almighty God to bless Arab and Islamic nations with prosperity and well being. The President received a phone call from Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed al Nahyan who greeted the President on the occasion. Meanwhile, the Armed Forces General Command congratulated President Assisi and the people on Eid al-Fitr. <music> Wishing all our audiences uh, the best and happiest wishes for the Lesser Baron Feast. And moving on, President Abdel Fattah Assisi inaugurated a number of Suez Canal Authority projects today. Now, the President witnessed the launch of the dredger Muheb Mamish, described as the largest in the Middle East, with a depth of 35 meters and an ability to take out 3,600 square meters per hour. The dredger, which is 147 meters long and 23 and a half meters wide, is the first of two dredgers to be received by the authority, with the second planned for August. Speaking at the event, President Assisi and his visit uh, and said his visit aims at confirming that the Suez Canal is working with full capacity. The head of state reiterated that the private sector has the right to take part in these projects. Assisi also said the project to build 34 fishing boats aims to develop the fishing sector. He saluted the families of the martyrs of national duty, adding that TV dramas over sacrifices of martyrs were watched with passion. Touching on the issue of Ethiopia's dam, the President said he understands the amount of concern over the dam, adding that Egypt's water rights will not be compromised by any means. The President described the negotiation path as a tough process that needs patience and perseverance. Also, Suez Canal Chief uh, Authority Chief Lieutenant General Osama Rabia addressed the event and he reviewed the scheme to develop the Suez Canal waterway. Rabia said that the, the authority is implementing giant projects, adding that the world witnessed a national epic in ending the evergreen crisis. He said the canal has scored new records in the number of passing vessels due to its competitive capabilities. Rabia also said achievement by the Suez Canal during the coronavirus reflects the solid nature of the Egyptian will. The Suez Canal Authority chief said the new Suez Canal has paved the way for developing the maritime waterway. He said the authority has kept up with the speedy development in global maritime transportation. And he also added that the authority has signed a deal for receiving three motorboats to deal with oil pollution adding that 34 fishing boats will be given the green light to start operation. <laughs> These were some of the stories making the news today, but now let's turn our attention to our topic in hand. And the President Abdel Fattah Sisi actually focused and addressed the, the Suez Canal Economic Zone, uh, focusing on investments to localize technology. And uh, let's check out this report and we'll be right back.
President Abdel Fattah Sisi has directed that the project strategy in the Suez Canal Economic Zone focus on investments that aims at localizing technology and possessing industrial capacity. In a meeting with the Prime Minister Mustafa Madbouli and Suez Canal Economic Zone Chairman Mohammed Yahya Zeki, President Sisi instructed focusing on investments that also create job opportunities. The head of state also gave his directives to maximize the projects related to the port system and marine services in integration with the nationwide comprehensive development process. This aims to raise the classification of the Egyptian seaports on the international map of navigation and marine services. President El Sisi asserted that the Suez Canal Economic Zone investment strategy should be technologically oriented with the aim of dismantling the digitalization approach across the various industrial sectors and entrusted in focusing on the SC zone investments seeking to digitalize ventures and localize technology and manufacturing with a view to upgrading the industrial and technological capabilities and creating more jobs. The president also stressed on the importance of giving prior attention to incorporating port system and maritime service projects to run in tandem with an overall development scheme in the country. For his part, Zaki briefed the president on the latest financial indicators concerning the investment projects in the SC zone as well as the current efforts to attract more foreign investments for planned industrial zones. He also reviewed the latest upgrades on the ongoing development projects of Silos and Docks in Ain Sohna and Al Arish ports, in addition to establishing a global center for maritime services in both ports. Zaki explained the executive plan for developing the eSports Zane port and establishing a car assembly plant in cooperation with major international car makers in the eSports Zane integrated industrial zone.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, starting off our discussion, let me first welcome uh, my very distinguished guest, Dr. Ale Aiz, Chairman of the Euro Mediterranean and uh, Black Sea Business Federation. Dr. Aiz, thank you very much for joining us. It's always my pleasure. Uh, Dr. Aiz, first of all, before we start talking about uh, the President's visit and really focusing on uh, localized industries and a focus on technology, when we expanded the Suez Canal and there was talk about the uh, Suez Canal economic zone. There, was, uh, there were a lot of aspirations, a lot of big hopes, a lot of optimism regarding the economic zone, talking about free trade zone, uh, the participation of Russia and China. So far since we started that whole chapter with the Suez Canal economic zone, how far are we in that uh, long journey? Uh, first, uh, doubling the Suez Canal and dredging it to accommodate the, not the present, but the next version of super container uh, ships and super uh, cargo carriers. Uh, this has created a very important site, actually, for two aspects, for industry as well as for logistics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what's more important than that is it's not catering to Egypt or even the region. Egypt is no longer a, a market of 100 million consumers. Egypt today is a 3.1 billion consumer market through the free trade areas. The last was the continental African free trade area that was launched by His Excellency President Sisi. And this is what attracts investments to come and localize in Egypt. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we were not looking at uh, just investments that will build uh, production facilities or logistic hubs that will be created to cater to region. We were looking to real value added and I won't use the word local content, but actually local value added. And that was a reason for, I won't say the delay, but for being a bit picky. Mm -hmm. Then came the COVID uh, problem that uh, postponed lots of activities worldwide and Egypt mm -hmm. was no exception from that. However, uh, answering your question, uh, in two weeks from today we will be witnessing the signature of the Polish industrial zone. Mm -hmm. This has been concluded, we've been working on it for almost two years now uh, and it will be signed in Egypt. Uh, we have a delegation by the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland who's coming to Egypt with a business delegation to sign the agreement. The Russian uh, industrial zone, we've been working on it very fast and there is a huge number of companies that already embarked on coming on board. Uh, the Chinese the same. Uh, I'm going to Belarus end of this month to conclude also the Belarusian industrial zone mm -hmm. where uh, they'll be manufacturing uh, heavy trucks and tractors uh, in the industrial zone. So it's moving very fast. However, uh, I have to insist that Egypt has been uh, based on the, the directive from His Excellency the President, uh, looking at technological uh, value added to more uh, local content in the industries. So it's not just having factories coming on board, we're looking at really something that's adding to the Egyptian economy. Yes. Well, if we're talking about uh, a Russian industrial zone, uh, a Belarusian one, and uh, all these industrial zones, what kind of industries will they be engaging in? Is it only um, uh, manufacturing uh, tractors, uh, vehicles? Are, are they manufacturing different kind of products and talking about localizing industries as well. What sort of industries are the Egyptians, the, the Egyptian investor uh, participating and working on uh, in this economic zone? Um, okay, let's take things from a proper perspective. First, uh, we're talking about all types of industries. Mm -hmm. However, uh, Egypt is focusing on a number of sectors where we believe we have value added because whether we already have the 
inputs, the raw materials, or we have the feeding industries that's existing, or we are interested in attracting the feeding industries as SMEs that will pull into such uh, industries. Uh, there are some sectors that are we consider priority sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, engineering is one of the key sectors where uh, Egypt is highly competitive. We're looking at uh, electric cars, we're looking at trucks and heavy equipment, we're looking at tractors, we're looking at all types of white goods, whether we're talking refrigerators, air conditioners, the, the whole uh, package. We're looking at the electronic industry. We're looking at the digital economy, the whole ICT industry, where Egypt is very competitive on global basis. We're looking at the pharmaceutical industry, uh, as well as the what during the COVID era proved to be a very important sector, which is all what is related to the hygiene uh, sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking at bringing back the textile industry, the whole supply chain from spinning to weaving to finishing and dyeing to ready-made garments, where again, Egypt is highly competitive in that sector. And such industries are moving from Europe south. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a competition within the region. However, Egypt is the most attractive. And when we talk about uh, textile, we add to it the leather industry from tanning to uh, design to manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about foreign investors and these uh, foreign industrial zones in the Suez Canal, now which would be easier, attracting a foreign investor to uh, be part of the Suez Canal economic zone or getting Egyptian investors to start up their own industries in the, within the economic zone, which is easier? Both, actually. Uh, first, a foreign investor will not come to a country where the local investor is not investing. Mm -hmm. The easiest thermometer for ease of doing business, forget the reports, forget the rating uh, organizations. The easy thing is, are people of that country investing in their country? If they're doing it, then I'm confident. Mm -hmm. So both are targets. However, the Egyptian investor is coming with local understanding, local know-how, uh, but he needs the technology. Mm -hmm. So what we focus on actually is the matchmaking, is matching a foreign investor with the local investor. But our target is simply uh, looking at localizing companies. We're looking at big major investments that will attract around them mm -hmm. the feeding industries, the SMEs that are the generators of jobs. Mm -hmm. And once you have the whole supply chain uh, organized, then things start moving forward. We're focusing at present uh, at creating an environment that's conducive to the SMEs, to the local uh, small industries. We're creating local clusters, whether virtual or physical clusters. So you get the whole supply chain of any specific industry. And we're working with the European Union at the moment a number of uh, cross-border cooperation projects where we're trying to create a mega Euro-Mediterranean cluster. Mm -hmm. So we're not using only the Egyptian SMEs, but we're using European SMEs with Egyptian feeding into major investments. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ayaz, now you've mentioned that Egypt is actually uh, quite advanced in the ICT sector and the present uh, spoke about uh, localizing the uh, industries with a focus on technology and a lot of people were sort of surprised uh, with Egypt being one of the leading countries and pretty much ahead within the ICT. How, how do you explain this? How, does, how did this come about, Egypt really taking that much of, of, of a leap in this sort of sector? Uh, ICT is... In Microsoft was established by a kid mm -hmm. in his garage. It doesn't need investments. It needs brains. And we have 100 million Egyptians, uh, almost the majority under 29 years of age. All of them are IT literate. And we have a good education in that sector specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, today, 1.7% of Egypt's exports are ICT exports. These are virtual products mm -hmm. that you export, bringing in foreign currency. Uh, 
let's not forget that a man day in Japan or in Europe or in the States is a man month in Egypt. So we're very competitive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, a huge part of the paid software uh, royalties is coming from Arab countries. Mm -hmm. So Arabization is a must. And if you Arabize in any other country, you're using expat Egyptians. Mm -hmm. If you Arabize in Egypt, you're using Egyptians. Mm -hmm. So it's a low cost competitive market. And there is a huge uh, support that's being provided by the Ministry of ICT, especially through ITIDA, where they're creating incubators, they're creating clusters. We have two European Union uh, projects that are supporting ICT clusters and their exports. And if you look at the new short term, we have the, the Agenda 2030 for Egypt. Yes. Uh, however, there's the 2026 that's been launched by Minister Hala Said few days ago mm -hmm. and ICT is a core component in it where they intend to duplicate Egypt's exports in that sector and to achieve that there is a lot of activities that are being done basically supporting all these startups we just uh, three days ago with a minister of international cooperation Rainer Mashot, a minister of trade and industry and the EU ambassador we launched new four uh, regional projects for supporting startups and innovation. Mm -hmm. And like the president has stressed more than once, innovation and technology is the key to have value added uh, exports. We're looking at moving from exporting raw materials and low technology products to increase the share of high technological input products, whether replacing imports or increasing our exports in these sectors and we have doubled that in the past three years and according to the agenda 2026 we're expecting to triple it in the coming five years mm -hmm. well from what you're saying there seems to be a lot of emphasis on the SMEs uh, the startups the entrepreneurs and this is something that maybe a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of the youth they're not really whenever they start a business they they don't first think of the Suez Canal economic zone they think of uh, the capital the bigger cities uh, work online social media and this sort of aspect of the startups how popular is it with uh, the 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 young entrepreneurs and the the, the startups and the SMEs, how easy and popular is it for them to just take that bold decision and move to uh, the Suez Canal Economic Zone? It doesn't have to be actually physically, but moving their attention and the focus of their business and investments over there. Uh, first, since last March, COVID has changed the modus operandi of doing business worldwide and Egypt is no exception. We're all working online, we're working from home, we're working remotely. Mm -hmm. So being in the Suez Canal zone or being elsewhere is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Feeding into the Suez Canal zone is what we're talking about. Yes. That's why we, under these new uh, regional projects of the European Union, we're creating a number of incubators. This is augmenting what the government, through different ministries, through Ms. Meda, the micro and small uh, enterprise authority through the ministry of ict through the ministry of housing through all ministries in egypt they're creating incubators for the companies working in the sectors feeding into this ministry in the same time we are creating another major project which is called plato which simply uh, is the big companies will become custodians and angels mm -hmm. to the SMEs. What does a, an SME need? They need market access, they need technology, they need coaching, mm -hmm. and they need access to finance. The first three, for the interest of the big company, have to be provided by them. So what we're doing is we're linking the big players mm -hmm. with the feeding industry or processing industry whether they're physically clustered around them or they're geographically scattered and virtually are clustered. So what we're creating is local clusters linked to regional clusters to help create matchmakings. And this has succeeded. We've been working on this for the past four years. Mm -hmm. And we've seen success stories where companies that were individual startups became today multi, not multi, tens of millions 
of dollars companies mm -hmm. with exports employing one of them is today employing 700 employees in a matter of two years so it works mm -hmm. and what they need is the support the government is moving from being the operator which was inefficient to the highly needed regulator they're paving the way they're putting laws regulations that make life easier for startups and smaller micro enterprises to operate and let's not forget there is according to different studies between mm -hmm. 40 and 60 percent of the economy which is informal mm -hmm. when you ease doing business this informal sector starts to formalize mm -hmm. once they formalize they have one important thing that will help them grow access to finance mm -hmm. and once they have this access to finance they start growing and then your GDP will start doubling very simply not by having new investments but simply by formalizing the informal sector. Yes. And this is another mandate that the government is putting very high emphasis on. We're seeing a huge legislative and regulatory revolution. The parliament is doing the legislative part and the government is doing the regulatory part. And this is hand in hand with the private sector representatives, the federations, Federation of Chambers of Commerce, Federation of Industries, where we're working very heavily with the government with one goal, easing mm -hmm. doing business through upgrading and modernizing legislations, upgrading and modernizing uh, regulations, and creating, I don't want to use the, the abused word of one-stop shops, mm -hmm. but actually providing everything virtually. Yes. And we see today the e-government that's led by the ministry. <coughs> uh, of planning, mm -hmm. where today even the lay person who can renew his uh, driving license, renew his car license, uh, renew his ID. There are so many services today that are offered by the government electronically. And this e-government is opening for private sector business opportunities because mm -hmm. they're the ones doing it actually. It's mm -hmm. the government is the regulator. And at the same time, it is easing doing business for everybody yes. and making life more pleasant mm -hmm. for the people of Egypt. Yes. Dr. Aiz, now, talking about uh, the startups and really encouraging this private sector and the, uh, the SMEs, now, you spoke about the access uh, of uh, finance. Uh, is that the responsibility of the custodian companies, the, the guardian uh, sort of companies, and also the SMEs I mean, not all the companies, not all the, the SMEs will, uh, will experience uh, profit and uh, success right away. A lot, of, a lot of them will suffer some losses because there's a risk element in that. Do these companies also provide a, some sort of a, a safety net uh, or a risk sort of management for uh, the SMEs affiliated to them? Okay. The problem of our banking system, this was a major problem. We followed the French system, which is collateral based. Mm -hmm. So an SME doesn't have collateral, so they'll never have access to finance. Life was very simple. Uh, when President Sisi took uh, responsibility of the country, one of the key elements that he focused on is access to finance. So there was an initiative by the Central Bank of Egypt offering uh, preferential loans to SMEs, 5% interest, which is one third of the ongoing rate in a very simplified matter mm -hmm. and uh, what's more important is semi started looking at what we call the non-banking instruments mm -hmm. so they started creating investment uh, companies investment funds and these investment funds started creating the non-banking instruments that were highly needed by the local market so leasing companies venture capital companies and not to forget our friends uh, whether donors or development funds and development banks uh, who are providing huge amounts of money. There is, according to our last survey, 22 billion euros of grants, technical assistance, soft loans availed for SMEs and the private sector. This money uh, is channeled, part of it through banks. Low interest. The advantage in these instruments is that they provide technical assistance in parallel mm -hmm. to the loan. Mm -hmm. So what used to happen is you go to a bank, it gives you a loan and leaves you in the air. So if you lose, 
mm -hmm. you lost everything. Today, what's happening is they provide technical assistance in parallel to the loan. So they coach you and take you in your growth uh, passage. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, huge element is the technical assistance provided by the incubators that are scattered now all over the country. And let's not forget also the new SME law that has been enacted mm -hmm. and its executive regulations have been enacted also. Uh, and it obliges the government to provide billions of support to uh, SMEs. And this does not include money only. It does not include tax incentives only, but it includes also technical assistance. It includes mm -hmm. also coaching. It includes taking their hands into international exhibitions, so helping them to promote their exports, uh, providing land infrastructure, even at zero cost. Again, this depends. W what we're trying to reach is the idea and its visibility and its mm -hmm. viability is the key for supporting a company rather than they have the money or the collateral. Yes. And this is something we've been fighting for for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And thanks to His Excellency the President and his directives, this is realized today. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, definitely this uh, reimagination of uh, the Egyptian industry is reimagination of the investments and the uh, cooperations taking place here in Egypt is one of the ways that uh, the economy and the government is uh, going for. Now, also, the uh, Egyptian government is working on on really working on raising the standards of the uh, maritime ports. Now, Egypt is renovating also El Arish port in northern Sinai to reach the international standards. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back. The Suez Canal Economic Zone announced that it is developing the Arish port in North Sinai to match up with the international ports in eastern Mediterranean region, allowing it to receive ships carrying up to 20,000 to 30,000 tons. After deepening the draft for 12 meters in order to meet the demands for customers of the Sinai Peninsula products, the head of the SC Zone, Yahya Zaki, said that the port renovation operations aims to increase circulation rates and expand the traded goods, whether general or strategic, in addition to providing job opportunities for the people of North Sinai and the governorates in all areas that serves the port's activities. Zaki explained that the port enjoys a unique location on the Mediterranean Sea, as it connects the continents of Europe and Asia, a factor which has necessitated its development, especially as it is the only port in the Sinai Peninsula that receives modern ships carrying huge tons and exports Sinai's goods such as cement, sand, salt and marble. He added that the development operation taking place in cooperation with the armed forces aimed to complete the projects within two years and bring it to the international levels. The SC Zones head noted that there are facilities granted to exporting companies to open new markets for them in Europe and North Africa, as 70,000 tons of Sinai products have been exported since the port was restarted to Russia, Syria, Greece, Morocco and Libya. Meanwhile, the Transport Ministry plans to start establishing the country's first factory to locally manufacture trains of all kinds starting from the beginning of 2021. The project includes the participation of the Transport Ministry, the Planning and Economic Development Ministry, the General Authority for the Suez Canal Economic Zone, the Savine Fund of Egypt and five private sector companies. It is being implemented by the National Egyptian Company for Railway Industries, which owns the shares with ownership shared by the Transport Ministry, SC Zone and the TSFE in cooperation with the five private sector companies. Egypt's aim is to establish an industrial base equipped with technology and logistics to receive international companies which own railway coaches and their requirements and to produce them locally at up to 40% according to manufacturing contracts. The state seeks to meet local, regional and African needs in light of the new developments in the field which help to localize these industries increase the national income and provide new manufacturing opportunities for the railway factories.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, continuing our discussion with Dr. Raez. Doctor, now, it seems that there is uh, great opportunities for uh, different Egyptian investors and uh, local industries here, be it in the Suez Canal Economic Zone or the uh, other uh, different mega national projects taking place in the country. Now, does that mean that for instance, let's focus on the Suez Canal Economic Zone. Do they need, uh, does it need a, a certain marketing strategy, uh, letting people know what exactly do they need, what sectors uh, they need more investments in? Is it something like uh, watching the, the real estate uh, ads on the telly, or does it, do they have different means of marketing uh, uh, themselves and the, uh, the fertile soil that it has? Or does it even need the marketing? Or do people actually, there's uh, an oversaturation of the influx of SMEs there? Uh, first, I won't use industries alone because mm -hmm. Suez Canal is a mega uh, area that caters to industries, to services. Mm -hmm. You have surrounded by it agriculture, Smilea. You have fisheries. The biggest in Egypt was unheard of in the fisheries uh, yes. sector. And suddenly, with all the initiatives that were uh, done in the very short uh, period, we're now number two in Africa and in the top ten in the world. So actually, it's doable. Mm -hmm. Then you have trade you have recreation, you have tourism, so you have a huge spectrum of business opportunities where manufacturing industry is only one of them. That's number one. Uh, first, it's demand-driven. The government paves the way, the government should have a strategy, which they do, uh, that what is my priorities for my country. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't mean that the foreign investor has to comply with it. I could give incentives to attract this type of investor that I want. So I want to uh, increase fishing fleet, and the president has instructed that new fishing uh, ships have to be uh, built. Uh, then I have to give incentives in that direction. But this doesn't mean that if somebody who wants to come and it's his decision based on his view, feasibility study, that he comes, why Egypt and why Suez Canal Corridor and why that specific product. Uh, but I can always, I won't say direct, but attract. These exports, this is my top two priorities. However, it is demand driven and mm -hmm. we cannot evade that. Uh, do I need marketing and promotion? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but before doing the marketing and promotion, I need to see where my competitors are. Globally, mm -hmm. so we're talking the Far East, we're talking Eastern Europe, we're talking South America, mm -hmm. and regionally in the Mediterranean and Middle East, so we're talking Turkey, Tunisia, Morocco, who are mm -hmm. my main competitors, as well as the Black Sea countries in Eastern Europe. And here I have to see what incentives they're offering, what is their competitive advantage. Some of my neighboring countries in North Africa they have everything like me, low-cost uh, human resources, well-developed uh, industrial zones, uh, good logistic connections, mm -hmm. but they don't have the free trade agreements that I do have. Mm -hmm. So here I have a competitive advantage then when it's an industry that competing with me in it, I don't need to give too many incentives. Mm -hmm. But if I find a sector where the incentives offered by my competing countries are even better than me, mm -hmm. then whether I like it or not, I have to offer more incentives. And this includes infrastructure, includes even free land. There is a lot based on this dynamic study that's being done. The same is being done in the mega master plan of Egyptian ports. Mm -hmm. What is the price I'm charging for logistics? Yes. Uh, when we talk about hub ports like Singapore, like Dubai, 80% uh, of the ships that come calling on them is mother ships coming with uh, huge big ships with uh, products that are downloaded there as a logistic hub and mm -hmm. then small daughter ships start distributing in the region mm -hmm. and then gradually they find it's non-economic to do this so they start 
produce, bringing raw materials for final production mm -hmm. to have the local content, mm -hmm. which is cheaper, and also to have the eligibility to enter into the free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a long process. In this condition, it's 80% transshipment, 20% mm -hmm. coming inland. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, it's the reverse. Most of my ports is 20% transshipment, 80% inland. What we're working on at the moment is to switch this mm -hmm. to become a major logistic hub where I have the best location. I have zero deviation from all international freight routes, thanks to the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. And doing that, you have to be very flexible in adjusting your fees, adjusting your rates, to attract more shipping lines to come to you, to attract more loops, which is the daughter ships that do the distribution. And this is what the government, the Ministry of Transport is working at at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that you've mentioned all these competitors and uh, you've also earlier mentioned that Egypt is actually more attractive than all of this competition. And you've less... Uh, Not in all okay, so and you've listed now some of the ways that how we can be more attractive uh, for foreign investors. How far are we uh, from fulfilling all these sort of uh, points you've pointed out? Uh, the logistics, the infrastructure, uh, free land, uh, all these things. How, how far are we in fulfilling these things to be more attractive and more competitive than our competitors? Uh, what, we're, uh, what has been concluded at the moment is a complete mapping of what is my competitive advantage mm -hmm. uh, and based on that, which sectors don't need support and then where other sectors that I want to bring into Egypt, like electric cars, for example, where there is a huge competition, mm -hmm. then I need to give incentives. These incentives, some of them are permissible according to Egyptian laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. Some of them are not. So here there are some legislative amendments that have been presented by the government to the parliament mm -hmm. to be ready to pave the way to attract all investments that we want and start what we're doing at the moment as campaigning. In the, since January, we're talking COVID area, uh, era. Mm -hmm. We had uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs with a huge delegation from Kazakhstan, from Croatia. Uh, we have done with China, with the European Union, tens of exhibitions and fairs presenting our competitive advantages. This was online because mm -hmm. of the ban on travel. Uh, we're receiving delegations coming in the next month uh, from the Gulf, from uh, Poland, uh, from Italy. So we're working on promoting Egypt but based on proper studies, proper reality, and doing it in a very professional manner where this uh, promotion is inclusive, the beneficiaries, so we're doing matchmaking between the foreign company and the best potential partner from mm -hmm. Egypt, where he or she will carry on promoting Egypt mm -hmm. and ensuring that this attraction materializes into a real project in the end. So it's a continuous process where it's dynamic, where once you reduce your or increase your competitiveness and attractiveness, competing countries do the same. Mm -hmm. So it's a staircase phenomena that we're always, so it's dynamic, it's continuous. And at present, it's the prime minister personally, who is the minister of investment responsible mm -hmm. for this activity. Yes. Dr. Aiz, now you're involved in many of the developmental uh, restructuring sort of work, be it here in Egypt, in, in different uh, projects here in Egypt and also abroad, and you're following up on all the government's uh, efforts and activities in, in, in doing that. What seems to be our biggest obstacle or our biggest hurdle or challenge to overcome, to actually achieve many other things that you're saying? Because it, it seems that there's so much to do and we want to do it as fast as we can to uh, bear the fruit as, as soon as we can. What seems to be the main challenges? What seems to be the main uh, hurdles on the way? Uh, maybe I'll take it from the opposite side. Mm -hmm. What are the main successes overcoming these hurdles? The mm -hmm. hurdle is simple. 
Uh, we, uh, King Farouk, uh, King of Egypt, uh, Sudan, and Wali Darfur, uh, laws that are still valid until today. Mm -hmm. So, again, there is under the Ministry of Planning, including Minister of Finance, Minister of Trade and Industry, so a big number of ministries, there's an initiative called uh, ERADA where we're doing a guillotine. Mm -hmm. We're just slashing these obsolete laws that are obstacles mm -hmm. to doing business in Egypt. The real success is the public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Why Egypt had 2.4% GDP growth, where all countries, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and maybe the rest of the world, mm -hmm. were between minus 9 and minus 30. It was a success story in 2021. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it was a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. The government listened the, to the experience that we had as federations, mm -hmm during 2011, during the curfew, which was local. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking during the pandemic, a global curfew. So there were presidential decrees enacted, prime ministerial decrees enacted, and governor of central bank decrees enacted, mm -hmm. 38 ministerial decrees. That's why when you saw pictures on TVs of shelves in supermarkets that are empty yes. worldwide, you go to the smallest village in Egypt and mm -hmm. the shelves were full. Yes. Why? Because the government did its role Mm -hmm. We enacted all these decrees on time before the disaster happened. Yes. And this was the difference. So what really needs to be done simply is to continue mm -hmm. doing that, talking, discussing, and we all have the same aim. Yes. Let's not forget that the private sector constitutes over 80% of GDP, mm -hmm. of employment, 100% of exports. So. And that's what the government is doing. They're listening to them being the real beneficiaries. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Dr. Aiz has mentioned, there is a lot of work that is uh, being done. Uh, the political will, uh, one of them, also the, the efforts by uh, the local industries, the, the efforts of the local investors and also foreign investors coming into the country. A lot of work still needs to be done, but still, there's a lot that we should feel uh, good about and aspire even for more. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this edition of The Daily Debate. But before we go, I'd like to thank my very distinguished guest, Dr. Ale, as chairman of the Euro-Mediterranean and Black Sea Business Federation. Dr. Aiz, it was a pleasure having you with us. It's my honor and privilege. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned for more coming up on Nile International. I'm Henny Saif. Thank you for joining us.